if you haven't uh, filled your coffee cup up, you know, that's why we're using this room so we can, you know, bring our refreshments in here and really uh, get a lot out of these, uh, these uh, uh, programs. Uh, and welcome to Great Decisions 2019. Uh, I'm Larry Bach, I'm the president of the World Affairs Council of Greater Hampton Roads. Uh, and this year we're going to be celebrating our 50th year of service to the Hampton Roads uh, community. And we've been doing great decisions for uh, nearly that long, I think. It's been uh, quite a big part of our, our program year. As many of you know, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan educational organization. Um, and we're dedicated to engaging and educating the, our community, the public in our community, on international affairs and foreign policy. And today, that mission has never been more important with events going on in the world, and, uh, and especially the explosion of internet platforms, which gives us every conceivable viewpoint and opinion out there, what's real and what's not. Uh, and that's why uh, these these sessions are real important, and I think given what's going on in the, in the world today and even in our own country, we need the opportunity to hear from experts on the topic that have studied this and made their careers doing this, as well as being able to have frank and open discussions um, uh, amongst ourselves. Uh, one of the questions I know you probably ask, and, and I've heard a lot uh, from folks, is what in the what in the world is going on? And, and, and that's what the Great Decisions Program was really designed to do, to help us with those answers. Um, and each year, the Foreign Policy Association in New York chooses eight of the most important foreign affairs, foreign policy topics of the year, uh, and they publish a book written by uh, experts on these topics, national experts, and they recently just uh, published the book uh, just in December. In fact, if you haven't bought one already, please uh, do so. Um, and, and the programs then are conducted among 94 World Affairs Councils throughout America, and it's a nationwide program, the same eight topics. Um, and then what, what they also do on their website, we used to pass out ballots and paper ballots here every week for those of you that have been coming for a while, but now it's all online. So you go on their website, uh, the Foreign Policy Association website, and, and you'll have opinion questions. What's your opinion of, uh, of what we should do with trade with China or what we should do, whatever the topic is? And, and these things are tabulated, and, and at the end of the, of the program year, because councils do these at different times of the year, the things are tabulated and sent to the State Department. They're sent to the uh, Foreign uh, Relations Committees in Congress and to the White House as a grassroots measure of what the educated public thinks about our foreign policies uh, uh, for that particular year. So they're pretty important. And here's how you can get involved in the foreign policy process. Um, and today's program could not be more relevant of what's happening today in our foreign policy. As we know, our relationship with China uh, will be a most important issue for many years to come. Uh, and just this week, the U.S. and China concluded a round of trade talks uh, that established hopefully a foundation that, that will set the stage for further higher level talks and is supposed to be occurring later in January in Washington, D.C. Uh, so here to introduce one of our foremost experts on this particular topic um, and uh, is the chairman of our Great Decisions uh, uh, Committee, uh, Dr. Matthew Hall, who will introduce our, our speaker today, who, have, who uh, if you don't know already, just flew in from China yesterday. So he is <laughs> really talking to the horse's mouth here today. So, so welcome, Matt. Morning. Good morning. Um, I didn't think I was going to be nervous about standing up here and, and starting the series and introducing our speaker. Last night I had a dream in which I got here at 7 a.m. for this 10 o'clock start time and you people were already here. <laughs> <laughs> and Larry was hustling around and, and he looked up, you know, he was doing something on the table, he looked up, saw me, and he gave me a look. 
So I was already in trouble. And then I, I looked down at myself and I was in my pajamas. Um, and that's when I popped up and I realized, oh, this is a dream. This is entirely unrealistic. I would never get anywhere that early. <laughs> Nothing about the pajamas. But don't, so don't be surprised if I show up here sometime in the next eight weeks in my jammies. Um, my name is Matthew Hall. I'm a visiting assistant professor of political science at ODU and the associate director of the graduate program in international studies, GPIS, um, and also a proud graduate of their PhD program. I mention that because the third person on my dissertation committee, the, the one external to the program, was our speaker today, Dr. Shelman Lee. And he was everything you want that third person on your committee to be. He was polite, he was timely, he didn't cause problems, and then on the day of my defense, he comes in and he proceeds to ask me a series of really difficult questions. <laughs> and they were, they were fair and they were helpful, but most importantly, they were difficult. That set the tone for the rest of my defense. The rest of it is a blur. That's the only thing I remember from my dissertation defense. So fast forward roughly a decade, and I have, I'm very proud to be on the board and to have helped organize this uh, speaker series. I'm very, um, very proud to have the, the, the honor of introducing Dr. Lee. Um, he has had an extra, for, for those of you who don't know, I think many of you do, but he has had an ex extremely interesting life that the rest of us can only imagine and probably not properly so. At the age of 18, he was drafted into the, into the position of soldier artist um, under the Mao regime in communist China. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understand that job involved was drawing a lot of illustrations. On a daily basis drawing, I think, if I read this right, 12 illustrations per day, two of them of Chairman Mao. Um, he did that until he was kicked out for bourgeois tendencies. <laughs> um, he eventually made his way into academia here to ODU in 2002, I believe, but that was after being uh, imprisoned by the Chinese government. Um, falsely convicted of espionage, of spying for Taiwan. Uh, he was released um, after pressure from the U.S. government, and fortunately for ODU, uh, he began, began his career here um, the next year in 2002. He is an emin eminent scholar and professor of international business at ODU, um, he has his B.A. in economics from Peking University. He has his Ph.D. in sociology from Princeton. He held a postdoctoral fellow. He was a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. In 2008, he was named the outstanding, he was given the Outstanding Faculty Award from um, Chev, the state sorry, State Council of Higher Education in Virginia, so an extremely prestigious teaching award. He is widely published in, um, he has been published, his uh, editorials, his op-eds have been published in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, the Financial Times. Last year, about this time, um, mentioning those illustrations, the Chrysler Museum of Art for several uh, months displayed his work, his illustrations, in addition to his large collection of uh, Chinese propaganda posters from that period of time. Um, and I believe illustrations that uh, of his 
from his of his prison cell from his time that he was uh, incarcerated. Um, so we're honored. I'm honored, and uh, without further ado, Dr. Xiaomin Li. Thank you, thank you, Larry and uh, Matt, for the introduction, and uh, I'm, I'm so glad to be here to uh, uh, to share my thoughts on, on China. As um, Matt mentioned, uh, uh, and also Larry, I just came back from China, you know, safely this time. Uh, so uh, it's really a timely event. You know. When uh, when Larry said good morning, I heard a roaring back. Good morning. I said, this is a good class because uh, you know we, we teachers all know that sometimes they say good morning to the undergraduate class. You really don't hear anything back. And then if you say good morning to a, a PhD class, they will say oh good morning. They will write it down. <laughs> so don't forget. Uh, some commented about it. Oh, you slashed uh, coming, and that's really you no. Know, Interesting. Well, I, I did not do it on purpose. Uh, it was an old slide uh, I used uh, in 2017. It was, uh, the, the title was The Coming Clash back then. I, I thought, gee, I warned many people about the coming, uh, coming uh, clash, but uh, many people did not really think, oh no. So, uh, and, uh, and uh, last year, uh, I. Uh, it, it was really the clash uh, was here, and it, it's still here. So that's how we started. Um, just to uh, give you some I mean, a, 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 uh, my personal story, like uh, uh, Matt mentioned, that uh, in 1989, because my <laughs> My, my arrest was due to my activities during uh, 1989. I was a kind of a uh, 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 democracy supporter in uh, advocate uh, in China. Uh, but I was when I was back then uh, because of my my uh, uh, my uh, my uh, uh, special interest in studying China and everything. I was asked often by. Uh, Governments, governments of uh, mature democracies, especially the U.S. government. The question back then was, how could, how can we help China to democratize? That was 1989 or early 1990s. And now, uh, I'm asked by those you know, uh, policymakers, the question is, how can we stop China from, you know, uh, the from making us become a, a dictatorship. So the question is kind of really from you know, trying to help China democratize to see how can we stop them from un, undemocratize undemocrat us. That's how time changed. Uh, okay. uh, the Cold War, the, the, the term the Cold War, which had disappeared for a while, kind of resurfaced. Okay. Uh, Here's a, a, a kind of a little case of how it resurfaced. The, the, the upper left corner of the picture is a picture of a, a protest at, uh, in America. They, they, are, they were protesting uh, against uh, China's Confucius Institute. The Confucius Institute, by the way, ODO has one. It's, a, it's an institute that is sponsored by the Chinese government to teach Chinese culture and Chinese language. And it appears really, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a cultural exchange, you know, very uh, harmless. Uh, but in, uh, uh, in August last year, well, uh, the University of uh, North, uh, North Florida closed uh, its uh, Confucius Institute. And uh, the bottom, is a comment by the Chinese uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs about the closing, and this is kind of one of the uh, maybe the one of the first times the China, uh, China accused U.S. being Cold War thinking. Okay, so 
if you read this, it's quite interesting. So, oh, you know, America is so narrow-minded. They have no confidence. You know, they they still have this cold world thinking, and uh, so they, they close this uh, harmless uh, Confucius Institute. I think this is. So I was when I when I read this, I was thinking, gee, who is cold world thinking? Okay, uh, Confucius Institute. And this uh, nice guy. Uh, gave me a lecture on Chinese language, Chinese culture, and they're promoting uh, understanding of China. Well, let's see. Uh, the, the irony here is, is quite interesting, because uh, the Communist Party, uh, founded in 1921, was on the platform of, uh, of against opposing Confucius. Confucius is everything that the Communist Party is against. Okay. So it's, it's quite ironic that uh, now Confucius, uh, Confucius is uh, suddenly become a loved uh, poster boy of the Communist Party. Okay. Uh, but uh, the, the quotation in red is by a, a leader of the Communist Party. And the Confucius Institute is actually a, a tool to project uh, the party's soft power. Uh, the economist uh, terms uh, sharp power now. It's, it's, a, it's a power that appears to be uh, soft, but it has a hidden agenda. So if we remove that podium from that nice old man, well, uh, he's not that nice. Uh, he, he, uh, so the Confucian Institute in the Confucius Institute, you cannot discuss all those topics. Actually, I don't think the Confucius Institute can host this talk. I don't know you, probably not. Uh, so is this an accurate picture? Well, it's partially accurate. This is the same guy, but you don't just, the only thing we don't see is uh, underneath what he is doing, but he really projects a very loving, smiling uh, uh, image to the world. That is what the Confucius Institute is about. It's not about what they, they can talk. It's about what they cannot talk about. Uh, the topics that are forbidden. So, uh, and that is why many uh, institutions like Chicago, uh, McGill, uh, uh, Penn State, many uh, universities are beginning to uh, closing, um, close down the Confucius Institute because uh, uh, for one thing, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just uh, send a wrong image of China. It's not a re the real image. Number two, there's no uh, reciprocity. There's no uh, symmetrical treatment. Uh, there, there are a few American culture centers in China, but they are uh, under very uh, restricted uh, terms. Uh, even the, uh, the U uh, American Ambassador, U.S. Ambassador in China, he cannot visit one of the uh, American cultural centers funded by U.S. government. And then CNN interviewed uh, the Chinese uh, uh, ambassador in D.C. and asked him very directly, you know, "Can you go anywhere in the U.S.? Is there any restriction on where you can go?" And he thought about it and said, "No, I can. No, I, I, there's no restriction." But there's apparently many restrictions on Americans where you, you can go in China. Okay. Uh, I think the most important thing to understand China is to understand uh, the Communist Party, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, a couple of points I want to mention. Number one, it is not a party. Okay. No, party, less party. Uh, party is you can you can freely come and go. I mean, uh, uh, there's no no one can uh, can uh, prohibit me from declaring I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican. It's a it's a really a free thing. You can freely walk in and walk out. Not for uh, the Chinese Communist Party. This is what uh, political scientists call the Leninist Party. It has certain principles. The number one, the most important principle is. It has clearly defined exclusive uh, membership. It's not that you just uh, declare you're a member. Uh, 
you have to formally apply, and the two existing members have to introduce you, and the, then you will be under a observation period until they say, okay, this guy is you know, good enough, uh, and then you, can, you have to take an oath. And the, another important thing is you can never leave. Well, you can never leave peacefully or without being uh, thrown in jail. They, if, you, if, uh, if you want to leave, the party will say you cannot leave, but we can expel you. They will have a formal procedure to kick you out. Usually that means the next thing is a jail term. Uh, so what does that sound like? It's a, it's a gangster organization. It's a mafia. So whoever translated this organization into a communist party made a big mistake. If I were to translate it as a communist gangster, a communist mafia, uh, it's highly hierarchical. Uh, the Politburo is uh, the, the top organ that uh, uh, rules the party, and underneath you have the Central Committee, and you have branches. The branches go all the way down to the society. Uh, usually they will say if there were three party members in the neighborhood, they have to have a party branch, formerly party branch. And there are about uh, more than 80 million party members approaching to 100 million now. Okay. So if you, uh, and uh, the, now they are trying to put a party branch in uh, AT&T's, GE's, uh, General Motors in China. All the foreign companies, they want to have a party uh, branch there. It's just a, a very, uh, comprehensive and, and uh, reaching uh, every uh, tip of the nerve of the society. I, I interviewed an uh, a employee from uh, Hitachi, a Japanese uh, company in, in China. So he said the party came to their, uh, their company said, you need to set up a party branch, Communist Party branch. And they were so afraid, they were so you know, panicking. They said, How, how can we work if we, you know, under the constant watch of the party uh, members? So he thought about that, and then this manager said, who is going to pay for, uh, for the party members? The, the party official said, you guys, you guys have to pay for the party members. And, and, uh, we will send them, and uh, they're on your payroll. And this guy, actually, the, the manager I interviewed, he's very smart. He, he asked this uh, question with a with a with a, a, a trick. He said, "Uh huh. See, uh, we are foreign capitalists, right? Foreign capitalistic company, you know, the, which is the the, the 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 enemy that the Communist Party is trying to overthrow." And the party said, "Yeah, we are the Communist Party. You are the capitalists." So, and uh, he said, "Then how can you communists accept capitalistic money?" <laughs> and he said, party uh, official just walked away. I mean, didn't. <laughs> uh, you may have uh, noticed that uh, the, the Congress and probably the, uh, the administration, they are trying to pass a law that will prohibit any Chinese companies that are doing business here that will have a party uh, branch. So that, uh, because of that, uh, the Chinese party stopped their pushing to have uh, party branches in uh, foreign forums in China. My point is, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, very comprehensive, ominous uh, organization that, uh, that is ruling China. Okay. Uh, the functional departments, uh, I think the, the Two, uh, the two of them are, are, are worth our attention. Uh, propaganda department, they will uh, this, uh, kind of uh, uh, manage, manipulate uh, the, the social attitude, social sentiment, not only in China, but now in the world. Uh, another one, the United Front Work. That, that, is, uh, that department uh, is... Uh, managing uh, Confucius Institutes and others that are trying to uh, 
as Xi Jinping put it, the President Xi Jinping put it, to tell the right story of China. Okay. So they're, they're trying to uh, manage, manipulate uh, public opinions uh, about China. Uh, the government is merely an extension of the party. There's no really real government in China. It's just a party organization in the name of government. In, in China, there is a common saying that one organization, uh, two names. So one name is a party name, and then one is a governmental name. So uh, for instance, if a foreign visitor goes to China trying to uh, look for a, a, a uh, see, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that's a government uh, organization. But inside, it, there's a party, uh, party uh, group, working group in charge of foreign affairs. So it's, it's really the party that is the government. So I think the, the most uh, succinct, uh, accurate way to call the Chinese uh, government or the party is just called party slash state. There's no difference between the state and the party. The party is a state. Uh, the third point that uh, we, we, we need to understand is uh, laws in China. Uh, I still remember a Professor Jeremy Kong. Uh, Kong, he is probably the, the most uh, authoritative uh, uh, figure in uh, uh, Chinese the Chinese legal system. When he is te when he was teaching a Chinese legal system, the first the first intro introductory class, he will say, uh, the most important thing you, you need to know about laws about the laws in China is, so we were kind of waiting, there isn't any. So th that is quite, uh, quite true. But now, uh, China has many laws passed. And if you uh, read them, they're, they're quite good. They have very comprehensive uh, intellectual property protection laws. Uh, like copied from Taiwan, maybe from Germany, because China is a continental uh, legal system. It copied the, uh, the, the German law. Uh, but it's, it's not used. Okay. And uh, now when they, uh, when they address people, when they address dissidents, they have a very thick code which when you, you violate it, all the made up. So uh, we, we call it a, a rule by law, not rule of law. You know, in in a, in the true uh, rule of law society, the law is independent, impartial, fair, transparent, so on and so forth. Uh, but the Chinese system is: if I if I want to uh, address you, I will make a law today and just use that to address you. And uh, the, everything is under the party. There's no checks and balance. There's no uh, uh, independent uh, legal system. So law is a tool, is a tool for the dictator to use. Uh, recently, uh, you, you probably have heard this uh, uh, Miss Meng of Huawei, who uh, is arrested in Canada, right, the case. And, uh, and the, the Chinese, uh, the party state is furious. The so the, the party state began to retaliate, they arrested uh, several uh, Canadians in China. So whenever uh, re foreign reporters or a Canadian government ask about the treatment of those uh, Canadians, the, 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 the standard uh, uh, reply from the uh, spokesperson in uh, China's uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is, China is a country of rule of law. We do everything in accordance to law. That's their, 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 their standard answer. So that is a party state. The party state is uh, everywhere in China. It controls a large uh, portion of the resource. Almost everything uh, you can think of. Uh, just a very quick uh, uh, kind of a review of the evolution of this concept of uh, the Cold War. We all know the, the old Cold War is between the U.S. and the Eastern Bloc, uh, 
led by the Soviet Union. Uh, I don't have to spend too much time. Uh, you know, we uh, here, uh, the, the mature democracy is uh, rep represented by the United States. You know, the freedom, human rights, democracy, rule of law. Uh, and the fast forward to today, uh, notice that we, the we part has not changed. We still have the same uh, democratic system, uh, the rule of law and, uh, and the human rights and, and uh, checks and balance democracy. Uh, now, the other party, uh, that party has changed from, well, the, the old uh, Soviet bloc is in the, in the basket now, in the waste basket. So what, what uh, uh, replaces it is uh, China, under Xi. Uh, so now, uh, uh, the China or the party state accuses U.S. Cold War thinking, which is really quite, uh, quite ironic. It's not us that we have the Cold War uh, mentality. It is really the party state in China. Okay. Uh, now, take a look at uh, how China has evolved or how the U.S.-China relation has evolved. In the, in the 50s until the, the 70s, this is probably a quite a accurate proportion in comparison of the two powers. And China was the, 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 the military, political, economic, and the military power of China was tiny. Uh, and then uh, Mao Zedong died in 1976. That ushered uh, the change in China, started by Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping was an architect of uh, China. I mean, he, 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 should, he deserved a lot of credit for China's opening up. So we can, see from, we can say from the uh, 1980s until maybe uh, 2010, in this period, the relationship is like this. Okay. Uh, uh, China, uh, under Deng's teaching, or uh, Deng's uh, tutelage, uh, he, he essentially they pro projected an image China was weak, China would never challenge the U.S., and by the way, China will democratize, China will become one of uh, you guys, China will become uh, a democracy as uh, China becomes rich and, and uh, prosperous. So that, and the, 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 the the so-called West. I don't like to use the word the West because uh, the the word uh, the, the phrase the West gives the Chinese Communist Party a lot of excuses. Oh, they're the West. We're not the West. Therefore, we don't really learn from them. I mean, what what do, what we mean by the West is actually the mature democracies. The mature democracies just happen to uh, to be developed in the West part of Western part of the the, uh, the world. So the mature democracies were, okay, uh, uh, let's engage uh, with China. So hope, you know, the hope is when they become uh, more advanced, when their economy grows, eventually people will demand for democracy. So, so that's, a, that's a, the thought. So the exchange uh, is like this. Technology, money coming to China, and China uh, had uh, uh, cheap labor and producing a lot of goods coming to the United States. That's kind of the, the general pattern of the exchange. And Deng, Xiao, Deng Xiaoping had a very famous uh, saying called, uh, uh, hide one's ambitions and uh, disguise its claws. So he is telling China to lay, uh, lay low don't challenge the U.S., you know, keep your mouth shut, making money. That's essentially their, their uh, his strategy. And uh, that, strategy, that strategy is served China well in terms of economic growth, in terms of accumulating wealth and power. Uh, today, well, I, I, I put it, uh, no. today's China, uh, China China has uh, has uh, one or two uh, aircraft uh, carriers, but they're they're you know 
more backwards and, and, uh, and the smaller. But uh, they are, they are uh, fastly, uh, uh, rapidly catching up. Uh, and the economic pattern is still the same. China is shipping goods and we are shipping money over the other way. Uh, and, but there is one change on uh, China's part. Xi Jinping, the new president Xi Jinping, just uh, put Deng Xiaoping's teaching in the basket. Well, now we're strong enough. We don't have to hide our uh, ambition and uh, hide, uh, disguise our claws. We can show the claws. We can tell the, um, the world our ambition. So that, that is today. Uh, in the, the trade, I mean, this is, I just copied it from the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal called it uh, a trade leviathan, uh, a huge trade monster. Uh, it's difficult to read the, the beginning part, but, but uh, the beginning part shows the, uh, the upper red part are the uh, high-tech goods and services that the U.S. is buying from China. And uh, the lower uh, light shaded uh, are the, uh, area is uh, the low-tech uh, goods that uh, we are buying from China. In the earlier part, there's very little high-tech goods. Most of the trade from China is uh, we, we're buying from uh, them are uh, low-tech. And I use this uh, fish versus a fishing rod uh, analogy. <laughs> China is buying fishing rod from the U.S. And the U.S. is buying fish from China. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, if you look at, there's, there's a, uh, right now, well, China is rapidly catching in the dark red part. So we're buying a lot of high tide from China. Yeah. And, uh, most of the technologies in China are either stolen from the U U.S. or a forced transfer. The forced transfer is, is, uh, is like this. For instance, GE. If GE wants to sell nuclear power plants or, or, or advanced turbo uh, generators to China, they will say, okay, give me the technology. Otherwise, I'm not going to buy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, GE, uh, for, for the, for the uh, short-term gain, GE would, would do that, would give the you know, GE, IBM, all the, the firms, they will have to uh, give the technology away uh, in order to uh, gain market share. Uh, so now uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a if it's not uh, all that war, but there is there is a, a, a rivalry, there is a a, uh, a competition in an adversarial sense, okay. but this competition is not uh, symmetrical. Okay. Uh, now we're in the, America is a free country, so we we allow uh, we allow China's uh, news agencies here. They're free. Not only they are free, they have money. Uh, I, I just surveyed all the uh, Chinese language media in the U.S. Probably 98% of them are bought by the Chinese government. Uh, and the, the Confucius Institute is freely uh, setting up their business here. Uh, China Daily, which is uh, the party uh, organ, uh, they can do whatever they like. In, in the U.S., but uh, can Google go to China? No. Can Facebook be built in China? No. YouTube? No. Uh, Twitter? No. Uh, most of the U.S. government, uh, U.S. publications? No. So, that, this is uh, the, the current situation. Uh, there's more. China is bribing the whole world. I, I just finished a book on uh, bribery and corruption in the world, especially on, uh, in countries with, without the rule of law, including China and other uh, less developed countries. So when I was writing the book, uh, corruption in the, uh, in the standard uh, 
political and economic definition is the sale of government goods for private gains. For example, if I'm an uh, officer uh, controlling passport, issuing passport, a private citizen come to me, uh, comes to me and says, I want my passport. And I will say, well, if you don't pay me, you have no passport. Okay. The passport application fee is $50, and I demand 80 So I will pocket 30 So that's a corruption. Uh, a private citizen or a private firm uh, pays a government official for government goods. Okay. Uh, the, that is a, you know, uh, remember, uh, private entities paying government officials for a, 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 a favor for a service. But China is, uh, the, the, the China, uh, China's party state put that model upside down. The Chinese government or the party state uses all the resources in China, bribing citizens, firms, everybody in the world. They're paying the whole world. And I was like, for what purpose? Why? For instance, think about the Confucius Institute. The Confucius Institute is like a, uh, about a uh, uh, hundred thousand to two hundred thousand dollars a part and giving a, a host institution like uh, ODU. So they can, they, they, will, they will set up a program teaching Chinese, teaching Chinese culture essentially for free to Americans. Why, why should Chinese government do that? By the way, American per capita income is about $50,000, and the Chinese per capita income is less than $10,000. It's about $7,000. Why should a poor country pay for a very wealthy country to, to teach culture? Well, their own kids, millions of them in the remote areas, have no school. It does not make any sense. So, uh, foreign aid. Uh, China has surpassed U.S. to become the, the, uh, the largest uh, foreign donor uh, in the world and giving out, uh, giving out uh, money in the world. Uh, again, uh, China... Uh, the, the rich people in China uh, do have a lot of money, but overall, that country of uh, 1.4 billion people is, is still very poor in terms of uh, per capita income. And uh, the distribution is not very even either. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is over $1 trillion. They are, they are supporting, well, they're, they're going to many countries traditionally in the Silk Road, meaning uh, uh, West Asia and, the, and the, uh, part of Africa, actually whatever the country that they will accept Chinese deals, they can get into this. Uh, so far it's like almost 70 countries are part of this uh, Belt and Road uh, program. China will, uh, will give them loans and send their construction teams to build bridges, roads uh, in those countries. Uh, the Confucian Institute I just mentioned, it's, it costs hundreds of million dollars per year in more than uh, almost 150 countries. Uh, another thing they are doing is called influencing the influencers. Uh, China set aside uh, 5.1 billion dollars scholarship for foreign students in China. They are paid better than Chinese students, they have better dorms, a higher scholarship, um, most of them are from Africa. Many African presidents uh, were trained in China. Yeah. Uh, and uh, another term some, some scholars use, uh, Western uh, enablers. They, they sponsor, support uh, think tanks in Western countries, in countries of uh, mature democracies, especially in the U.S. Many uh, think tanks in, in, uh, in the D.C. area, in this country, are receiving Chinese money, either as a, as a, a donation or projects or whatever. Um, one of the uh, uh, a, a, uh, billionaire exile from China uh, by the name uh, Mr. Guo, Guo Wengui, 
he used to work for the uh, secret police in China. So he said China has a plan called the blue, gold, yellow to, to buy or corrupt uh, uh, important uh, influential people in, in the US, he claimed. Uh, blue means the internet. They will first hack and, uh, and put surveillance on the target, uh, like uh, uh, high level officials or scholars, whatever, uh, uh, political figures. Gold means money. So then give them money. And yellow in Chinese means uh, pornography. So yellow is uh, sex, uh, sexual service. So they use you know, internet hack, uh, money, and uh, sex to corrupt all the, 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 the influencers. Okay. Uh, there's a, a Thousand Talents program. The Thousand Talents program is a program China, the party state started to recruit uh, scientists, mostly scientists, scholars from the West. Uh, most, most of them are Chinese origin. They're, uh, they're leading scholars in their own field. So China uh, will offer them job, uh, jobs, and uh, usually uh, the, uh, the compensation is several times of their current pay in their American universities. And, the, and the, the, the best part is you don't have to quit your American job. So you can keep your American university job while working for, for China, which is better than if you quit because you can still uh, have access to the cutting edge technology and everything but, but working for China. Okay. And uh, we even have a few uh, at ODU. Uh, the, uh, so all those they spend a lot of money. And, uh, the the Southern Talents program is also kind of a, a, a bribery uh, arrangement because uh, they are not only paying the uh, the scholar uh, him or herself. They are only pay, they also pay uh, the institution. For instance, they will pay ODU to buy this scholar uh, scholar's teaching time. So ODU is happy. The department of that person is also happy. The person is happy. The only loss is you know, technology will be funneled to China. So this is this is what I call. Uh, 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 think, think about this. Why should a government using their own taxpayers' money to do all of this? Uh, well, the trade war is old news, so we don't have to spend too much time on it. In general, the, in general, the trade war started with a huge trade imbalance. That is how uh, originally uh, President Trump viewed it. He somehow uh, hated uh, deficits. He just said, "No, you, China can you, you cannot have a huge deficit with the U.S." Uh, and the economists uh, quickly point out that that view is is not quite uh, uh, rational or accurate. Because uh, deficit itself may not be an issue, may or may not be an issue. For instance, uh, you know, deficit is, is imbalance. I, a buys more from B. In, in that case, A has a deficit to B, and B has a surplus, right? So that's A versus B. You know, I, uh, ODU pays my salary. So ODU is buying my service. Do I pay anything back to ODU? No. So ODU has a deficit with me. Uh, and, uh, and I have a surplus with ODU. And when I go to Costco, in the Costco, I will have a, a huge deficit with Costco because Costco never buys from me. Of course, overall, if, if ODU pays more than I spend at, a, at a Costco, I have a little surplus. So I'm OK, right? So it's okay that we have a deficit with country A versus country B. That, that is fine. Uh, of course, uh, America, um, the, the, the U.S. overall has a deficit. So we're not only with China, uh, in general, we're buying a lot more than we're, we're selling. That, that is an issue. Okay. But quickly, uh, Trump was educated or taught by his A's. In the, now he, Nobody really thinks uh, deficit is the issue anymore. 
it is just a, a, a byproduct of a much larger problem. The, the, the much larger problem is what we call the structural issue. Yeah. <clears throat> so what are the structural issues? Uh, we can take a look at uh, uh, the demand from China, uh, from U.S. Uh, to China. Uh, uh, U.S. demands the falling from China and the changes. Uh, lower the tariff. Okay. China has a much higher tariff. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say cars. Uh, the U.S. Uh, imposed a 2.5% uh, car uh, tariff to all foreign cars. Two five point, two five point, uh, two point five. Very little. It's, it's almost like nothing. China imposes a minimum of twenty five percent. Depends on uh, the, the the grade of the car. If it's a luxury car, it can go beyond uh, about a hundred percent tariff. So that's and uh, uh, another interesting thing is uh, the so called uh, 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 most favored nations. Most favored nation, we well uh, in nineteen early nineteen nineties in, in 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 the early nineteen nineties, right after Tiananmen Square massacre, which occurred in nineteen eighty nine, the the Congress was debating whether the U S should give China the uh, most favored nation status in trade. Okay. Eventually, uh, U S did give that status to China to help China a lot. The most favored nation status says. If uh, A and B, if U.S. and China have most favored nations, then each country should give the lowest tariff that you give to any other countries okay, and to China. And the U.S. gave 2.5% tariff on cars to other countries. Therefore, U.S. has to give 2.5% uh, to China. That's the most favored nations. And China is also doing the same. China gives 25% uh, on U.S. cars. U.S. said, gee, that's too high. And China said, well, that is the lowest we're giving to other countries. So we're treating you very, very fairly, fair and square. No complaint. You have no complaint. That's the lowest we can give. So th that's why the, 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 we're complaining the, the, the WTO uh, deals is, is all wrong, because China said, oh, we're giving you the best. The, the, our best is this high. Uh, Lower tariff, lower entry barriers, uh, and uh, well, entry barrier. The China has many uh, entry barriers. Uh, for instance, you have to have a, a, a domestic partner if you enter certain uh, industry, and many industries you are just not allowed to, en uh, to enter at all. For instance, Google, Facebook, all the internet companies cannot go to China. Uh, uh, better intellectual intellectual property protection. That's also uh, we're demanding from China, uh, buy more from U.S. Uh, lower, and uh, those uh, the, the improvements, uh, lower tariff. Uh, China has lower tariff uh, substantially. It's easy. It's relatively easy for China to do. Okay. Uh, entry barrier depends on what. Uh, they, they will never allow Google, they will never allow uh, Facebook to enter China for political reasons because they cannot allow uh, a free flow of information. That will fundamentally undermine the regime. The, the regime rules uh, on uh, information uh, censorship. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just came back from China. People said, gee, you have first hand knowledge about what's going on in China. I said, no. In China, everything is censored. Everything is not. Better IP protection. As I said, they have a very good IP laws. They just, they just don't practice it. And there's, there's no way to practice it because there's no independent court. How can you make a, make a ruling when there's no, uh, no debate in the court, no uh, fair hearing of, uh, of both sides? And you have no jury, nothing. So everything is uh, by the party's order. Even if they wanted to have a, a good IP protection, they can still they, they could still not do it. Okay. Uh, buy more from the U.S. That's the easiest thing, the most easiest thing they can do, and they are doing it. Uh, we will buy more agricultural products. We will buy more of this and that. Uh, 
uh, fundamental changes. Number one, uh, reduce the role of uh, dominant reduce the dominant role of the uh, state in the economy. China will never do that. Uh, all the most lucrative industries are controlled by the state. Oil, banking, aviation, uh, you name it. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, they're humongous. I mean, now the largest banks, largest firms are all in China. They're all state-owned. They're very inefficient, and they only hire uh, uh, cronies, party members, uh, high and officials, children. That uh, it's a. Uh, it, the, the, I, I have uh, I, I talk to people, talk to new graduates in China when they interview for like a, a, a good banking jobs and other jobs. They don't really ask what do you know. They just uh, know uh, what do your parents do. If your parents are party members or officials, you're, you're hired. I mean, that, that, that is. Uh, uh, so, uh, and the, the party's control over the country is supported by their, uh, what they call SOEs, state-owned enterprises. So number one, they cannot really uh, change. Number two, open the internet, no. Number three, allow workers to organize, no. Uh, stop farm, uh, farm subsidies, uh, you know, and uh, Made in China 2025. Uh, some of you probably know this, uh, Made in China 2025 is a strategic plan that China will achieve dominance in the world in the following industries. Artificial intelligence, um, computing, uh, space, all the, uh, and the bio, biology, uh, biomedical science, all the future leading industries China will dominate. How do they, how do they achieve it? By by stealing, by force transfer, by whatever the means. Okay. Uh, the uh, uh, I, I have seen a talk by uh, Peter Navarro. The oh, okay. And he uh, he is a uh, economic advisor to uh, the, in the White House. He had he he assembled a matrix of uh, six by fifty, the six industries, and the, the six industries that Chinese uh, the, the made in China twenty twenty five wants to achieve dominance. For each industry, there are fifty measures the Chinese government can take to achieve that dominance. And he will put a check if, if China is doing this. If, it, if not, it will be empty. So he has a matrix of what China is doing in those uh, six, six industries. He said he presented that to the Chinese uh, party. Usually, you know, if you present something to the Chinese party, they will blast it. And this is all wrong. This is all you know, fabricated. But when he presented it, it's a dead silence. They never replied because his matrix is quite accurate. Okay, uh, let me quickly wrap up and we can, actually I'm, I'm almost done. Okay. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this, uh, uh, this table. Okay. Uh, China and the U.S. in terms of the size of the economy, they are roughly the same depending on how you, we calculate. I, 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 I take the average between uh, nominal GDP versus uh, PPP GDP. In purchasing power uh, parity GDP. So they are roughly uh, 12 trillion, so 20% uh, of the world, same size. Uh, and uh, I want you to look at uh, column 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Percent of a GDP controlled by the state. Uh, the US government controls about 33% of GDP. And the Chinese government controls about 56% of the total GDP. Okay. The Chinese government has a lot of money. Okay. Uh, even though on the per capita uh, basis, uh, US is much richer. You know, 60,000, China is only 9,000. Uh, and the, the reliance on trade, on international trade, China is a, a lot higher. So China cannot live without foreign trade, without international trade. 
And of course, one is a totalitarian regime, one is a democracy. So who has, which government has more money? I mean, that's pretty obvious. Chinese government probably has the most money in the world. And the US government, uh, uh, the uh, budget, uh, a large portion of that spent on social welfare. And China has very little spending on social welfare. Most of the spending of that 56% is military, police, and, and uh, foreign uh, propaganda, stuff like that, okay. to maintain the state and the, the regime's rule. Okay. Uh, so now that's a question, can the US avoid the new Cold War, or whether can China and the US avoid the, 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 uh, the Cold War? Well, maybe in the short run, because both want to make a deal in this uh, new round of uh, uh, trade talk. But in the long run, uh, I'm less uh, optimistic because a couple of things. The China, the China has to rely on foreign trade. So Chinese have to, they have to go visiting all the countries in the world. When they visit all the countries in the world, Chinese citizens will say, look, and they have this freedom. They are so free. They can do everything in their country. How come we cannot? So when they come home to China, they complain. They make fun of the government. They think they're backwards, but they have to do it, you know, uh, privately. They cannot really do it publicly because they get arrested. But the government get annoyed. They say, we have to do something. Uh, China cannot close the door, and China has this uh, party state ideology, communism, whatever, dictatorship. So the two cannot reconcile. If China uh, goes on like this, China has two options. Either China will, be, will embrace democracy, become one of us, or China say, okay, if we cannot, uh, the, the Chinese, the, the party state has no intention whatsoever to, uh, to embrace democracy. And they made it very clear to the world, they are not going to do that. So they have another option. Well, if they cannot do that, why don't we make the whole world China? So they are trying to, uh, that's why they are trying to bribe the whole world. You know, to, they bribe the world so we can we, we will be quiet, or we will uh, uh, we'll, we'll tell the Chinese story along their line. So that's their, their intention. The uh, last point is uh, mo many uh, high level officials in China. They either have their children here in the U.S. or they will have assets here or they themselves will move here after they retire. So I made, you know, uh, I said I was an artist. I, I am an artist, so I made a little cartoon. You know, <laughs> they, the, the, the corrupt officials, they love China. They, they loot the country with money. And then they say, oh, we love America because we can safely deposit them here. You know, the state cannot take. So the, the, this is uh, the, 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 uh, another ironic part of this, uh, this relationship. Uh, I, I talked to the Chinese uh, officials in China, and uh, I said, you, know, you guys want to turn America into China? Oh, no, we don't, because we have our money parked there. We have our children, and the keep, we want to keep them there. We just want them to shut up. We just want, we just want to control them, but we don't change them because of this. Okay. Uh, so uh, I will leave this. Uh, no. This is the background for our discussion in the next part, so I probably will stop here for, 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 for all of us to think about. Yeah. Well, why don't we uh, take a break, get your questions ready, because we certainly have a lot to, to discuss here. So let's come back in about uh, 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 12 minutes or so, we'll pick it up about 20 after.